Hi everyone. Welcome to TEPI's Infection Prevention 203 module titled Surveillance. This is just a brief introduction on what surveillance in, when and why we conduct surveillance, along with how we conduct surveillance activities. Uh, feel free to post questions in the chat throughout the presentation. After the learning part of the lecture, we will have a knowledge check to kind of gauge your uh, learning capacity. And then at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll receive a link. And also on the screen, there will be a QR code that will take you to a short post-survey evaluation of today's lecture. We would greatly appreciate if you complete this survey. Um, winners are, or individuals that complete the survey will be eligible to enter in their email address to chance to win some TEPI merchandise that we will mail out to you. And this feedback really helps us develop these lectures, bring more topics that you, um, you are really seeking and you're wanting more information on. Within a week, you will receive an additional email with a link to today's recording module along with the slide deck. So the slide deck will be posted and sent out within about a week of today's presentation. So thank you all for attending today's lecture and let's get started. So before we get into today's lecture, we'll just briefly talk about what TEFI is. And TEFI is the Texas Public Health, um, sorry, Texas is the epidemic public health institution known as Texas, and uh, TEFI and is uh, housed here at UT Houston School of Public Health in Houston, Texas. And the goal of TEFI is to really keep Texans safe and build a strong Texas economy in preparing for the next infectious disease outbreak. Uh, at the end of today's learning module, there will be a couple QR codes at the end of the lecture that will give you more additional links and resources about what TEPI is and some other material if you want to go and explore what the organization is. My name is Kayla Rush and I'm today's presenter. I'm an infection prevention practitioner who is certified in public health. Uh, certified in the healthcare accred accreditation process and I'm also certified in infection control and prevention. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, I had the opportunity to work in acute care hospitals here in Texas. And then I went out to New York City and worked in long-term and nursing home facilities there. And then I went out to California and worked in um, back into acute care hospitals out there before returning to UT Health School of Public Health to pursue my PhD in epidemiology with specific focuses on infection prevention and control. So today's learning objectives of what our goals are for this learning module is to describe what surveillance in is, explain why and when we conduct surveillance, and describe kind of how we conduct surveillance and develop a surveillance plan. As again, these are just a brief overview of these topics. Um, there's always more information that you can seek out that we'll provide in our resource sections that if you want to deep, uh, dive deeper into the topic, you can. So before we begin today's lecture, here's just a few terminology that we want to present to you um, that you might hear within today's lecture. So we'll talk about attack rate, our case definition specifically that it is a uniform applied criteria that really helps us determine if something is within our scope of our surveillance for our event um, or healthcare associated infection that we are monitored. And then also a cluster group is a, a group or a situation where cases kind of unexpectedly happen that are going from an endemic rate to an epidemic rate or to maybe kind of notify of us of an outburst event or an outbreak situation. So what is surveillance? Surveillance is an essential component of an infection for prevention and control program. And we usually define this as a comprehensive method in measuring outcomes and related processes of care, analyzing data, and providing information to members of our healthcare team to, to assist in improving these outcomes. 
Our surveillance programs are guided by mandatory federal, state, and facility reporting uh, requirements, along with accreditation requirements. They are constructed bases on epidemiology and statistical principles that we'll talk more about later in the slides. And surveillance activities sh should support a system that can identify risk factors for infection prevention issues or adverse events that we'll see in healthcare settings then help us to implement risk reducing measures and then monitor the, the effectiveness of these measures in infection prevention and control practices. And the goal of a surveillance program is to really help ensure that we have a safe environment for both our patients and our staff in our healthcare setting. So why do we conduct surveillance? And the best reason to understand why is kind of look at our historical surveillance development here in the United States. Understanding where we, what has happened in the past really helps us implement the practices that are now required. And our first important event that happened was in 1958, where in the American uh, acute hospital settings, there was a national outbreak of streptococcus infections. Um, that led into the development of healthcare acquired definitions for healthcare acquired infections that we use. And you'll specifically see this in our NHSN, our National Health Safety uh, Network definitions, looking at our MRSA, which is our NDRO staff infections that we see and monitor. The next big event was in 1980, where then there was an increase in state, federal, and accreditation agencies that expanded infection prevention practices, not just to acute care, as we saw most of our medicine in the United States was done in the 50s, there was just the acute care setting that we had expansion into more of our outpatient clinics, our long-term, our development of increased nursing homes and long-term care facilities that we were starting to then apply some of our infection prevention practices that we saw in the acute care setting now into these other spaces. Um, so before we were starting to really use these definitions and develop ICP plans in those spaces. Then we jump forward 30 years to in 2000, the, now that we're seeing an increase in regulations of hospital acquired infections. So this was modifications of our healthcare acquired infections, more expansion of the CDC and the development of the National Health Safety Network, NHSN, their manual, their epi definition that we use, along with seeing an increase in infections pathogens as well, and kind of that there was more outcry from the public at the state level that we needed to be looking at things in a different way and have more surveillance being conducting on these activities to potentially help prepare us for the next outbreak. So from the 2000 to 2020, we saw modifications increase. We saw some emerging pathogens. And then in 2020, we saw COVID-19, which really changed the evolution of how we do surveillance, how we communicate, and kind of the importance of pandemic preparedness. During this time, we also saw an increase of MDROs, not only in 2020, but before from about 2012. Um, to currently, we're seeing more strains, mismanagement of antibiotics, and then additional um, increasing of reporting guidelines and measurements as well. So that's just kind of a brief history of why we conduct surveillance here in the United States. So now that we know why we conduct surveillance, when do we conduct these surveillance activities? And a lot of it goes from really conducting surveillance activities to help create a safe environment for patients and staff. One of our core infection prevention pillars that we talk about. And by conducting surveillance, we wanna identify specific uh, potential risk factors and specific events in different spaces and then implement different reduce um, either process improvement um, and safety measures to reduce the risk of those events to happen. So in a lot of spaces that we see that are our occupational health factors. We talked about that in our previous module in module 202 about our OSHA bloodborne pathogen, 
our respiratory uh, program that is required um, along with reducing sharp incidents and staying safe at work. Another area we look at as our infection prevention annual risk assessment. That risk assessment lays out our surveillance plan as we have put in the different levels of risk for certain areas within our plan and then modifying our surveillance to uh, tailor to the areas that have the most risk, having more streaming surveillance activities to areas that have least risk, um, having fewer surveillance activity, along with being compliance with federal and state regulatory and accreditation agencies, so making sure that we are conducting surveillance the way that it is required at the state and federal level, um, which then we're also using that information to then to conduct our facility risk assessment. And that can be our situational risk assessment for certain types of events. Um, and then also those assessments that go into our annual plan. Uh, another area that we conduct surveillance is in adverse events and risk factors. So anytime there's been a situation, um, either a patient harm issue, a staff harm issue, certain risk factors, we're wanting to co conduct surveillance activities to identify these risk factors and then put in some hierarchies of controls to reduce the risk. Along with looking at um, other surveillance, we have our antibiogram, which helps us identify our prescribing of our antibiotics to help reduce MDROs and be aware of emerging pathogens that we are seeing within our community. And that is also helpful um, information to know what our baseline is for certain pathogens in infection so that then we are seeing when it's an endemic and typical seasonal pathogen, if we're seeing an increase of numbers that is as expected, and then if it is shipping from that endemic issue to that then epidemic issues or cluster event or outbreak event, then we are already aware of the situations and we can qu quickly put control measures in place to help contain and reduce the transmission of certain bacteria or pathogens. So in infection prevention, we talked about areas, but what specific areas or what is under our scope of practice that we specifically co conduct surveillance activities? And as we've mentioned in um, modules last year, our 100 series infection prevention is responsible for many things in the healthcare setting. In a lot of these areas, we are conducting surveillance on um, some big components, our hand hygiene compliance, our isolation compliance, those two things can really cut down on the spread of transmission and break that chain of infection that we specifically talk about um, to reduce risk to our patients and staff. When we have new patients being admitted, conducting surveillance activities, if they're coming from a long-term care or a nursing home, if they are susceptible, if they might be carriers or pathogens, if they've been colonized with something that we are reviewing them on admissions, obtaining cultures so that we can contain that, that specific pathogen and it's not spread, our healthcare acquired infections, our HAIs, along with our MDROs that we've talked about um, is a great way to measure our antibiotic prescribing administration, that we are properly using antibiotics um, to really reduce the risk of developing new MDROs within our community and our patient population. Next, our emerging infectious diseases, making sure that we are aware of what's going on in our community, which can be local, state, and nationally, so that we can put policies and plans in place to help us be more prepared for the next pathogen. Um, and then looking at our seasonal infectional diseases, and that's when I was talking about last slide about something that is endemic seasonally. Um, right now we are in cold and flu season, so seeing an uptake of influenza, RSV, and COVID is as expected, but also looking at that number that is it within expected name or is there a huge increase that should be then unexpected. And then also going into our summer seasons here in Texas with uh, mosquito and vector-borne illnesses, such as West Nile, Zika. Last year we had um, a couple cases of malaria. Um, so that might be something to be thinking about this year when patients are presenting with flu-like symptoms of maybe testing them for assays from those vector-borne uh, diseases along with looking at our um, instrument processing, both our high-level disinfection, our sterilization, making sure they're being within compliance, that we are not 
accidentally spreading something based on breakdown on policy or procedure or practice, um, along with our environmental cleaning and disinfection practices, being compliant with our re reportable diseases, um, and then lastly, looking at our construction renovation projects and making sure that we are staying safe on our construction sites and that we are not exposing our, our patients and other healthcare workers to specific construction debris during those times. So as I mentioned, surveillance, we have requirements both at the state and the federal level. Usually in infection prevention, the biggest federal level compliance that we have is our National Healthcare Safety Network, which is our NHSN, that puts a manual out every year with healthcare acquired infections, epidemiology definition and case definition, um, and how that is required to be reported every monthly into NHSN about how many HAIs that you have, and then also uh, reporting that to the state as well. Two other big networks that um, we use from the federal level is our Hans and COCA reports, and these are just communications that healthcare facilities will receive to potentially alert them what is lurking in the community if there is a certain pathogen expected or um, ex expected, but an increased number, so that that's that shift of endemic to epidemic status, or if it's a pathogen that we don't currently see in our community, but we're starting to see in um, maybe other pockets throughout um, our neighboring states or system that we should then start screening. We can disseminate that information to our healthcare providers to making sure that, hey, when patients come in, um, this is something atypical, but still be on the back burner for your diagnosis and clinical rule out if they are presenting with these common symptoms that other states are seeing for a specific pathogen. Then at the state level, we have our mandatory notifiable conditions. That's our annual um, list that um, is set out along with our timeline and how we need to notify our state and local public health departments of those specific pathogens. We get our state alerts um, for certain things that have happened that might be going on in the community um, that we work with, and also collaboration just with our state and local health departments on educational calls, webinars, modifying our surveillance activities based on their guidelines too. So that's kind of why we conduct surveillance, what we conduct on surveillance, but now how do we conduct surveillance? So in healthcare systems, there's three typical methodologies that we use. We use whole, targeted, or combination. So first methodology with our whole uh, surveillance, that entails looking at the whole facility in entirely for a specific event that we're monitoring. And we usually do this for our big tier uh, items, such as our healthcare acquired infections, our hand hygiene, and our isolation compliance, along with our antibiogram, antibiotic prescribing. Those are kind of some example of whole uh, surveillance areas and topics that we conduct. Then we have targeted surveillance activities, and that focus on specific areas or processes or procedures that might be deemed as high risk for potential um, adverse events or negative outcomes, and that we are really monitoring closely, trying to reduce those risks of potential infection or harm being done. And some examples of that is our high-level disinfection and sterile processing. So that goes back into our previous modules um, of looking uh, of our 102 module from last year of looking and tracing our high level disinfection sterilization starting at the procedure room with them all the way tracing that item to reduce the risk of exposure of bacteria and pathogens to the next patient. And then our last methodology that we have is a combination which is a mixture of our whole but targeted. And that um, methodology is usually used for problem areas. So you'll start off with your whole area, such as looking at, let's say, hand hygiene. And then as you're monitoring different units, you see a specific unit, let's say um, the intensive care unit is having repeated uh, 
lower levels of compliance of hand hygiene. So then maybe you're conducting a specific surveillance plan within that area, identifying gaps, working with multiple stakeholders to develop a plan to improve compliance, to reduce potential harm to staff members and um, our patients. So once you have your methodology determined of how you want to go about conducting your surveillance, then you're looking at your measures of surveillance. And four basic measures that we look at or that we usually calculate is measures of frequency, measures of center tendency, measures of dispersion, and percentiles. Um, measures of frequency are our typical top um, go-to measure that we conduct in infection prevention, especially that rates and ratios are national benchmarks that other facilities and also that the federal system NHSN uses for our specific SIR or our standard infection ratios um, that we use. So it's great to look at and, you know, for specific rates, that's our time component of looking at specific number of infections over our denominator, which is everyone with that specific device or that patient population, and then within the specific time um, uh, period as well. Next, then we move into our central tendency, and this might be some internal stuff or depending on what metric you want to use instead. Uh, looking at your um, mean, as in your average, your mathematical average mean of compliance of what level that you're achieving, your median is um, what is your middle number that you're getting in your mode if there is common um, number that is most presented, say that multiple units are getting 90% compliance. Um, that's kind of what those measures look at. Next is our measures of dispersion, and that kind of looks at your uh, variance within a certain practice um, that gets measured into your standard deviation. So the smaller level of dispersion means lower level of variance, which is always good. So you always want that number to be really small. If it's large, it shows that there's more variance between um, either unit performing a certain procedure, practice, um, implementation levels might be different. Uh, so you always wanna go investigate if you're seeing this very widespread. And then lastly, you have your percentiles, which are just a benchmark to see how you're performing you have your typical, you know, 10%, you have your 25th, upper, upper 25th percent, bottom 25th, 50th in the middle, and then 75th up or bottom. So those are kind of the typical measures that we see in infection prevention. So now that we've talked about our methodology and our measures, what goes into effective surveillance and conducting the effective surveillancing and then developing a surveillance plan. And we'll talk about each of these in detail, and then at the end of this section, we'll go through um, a case scenario and kind of walk through the steps of how to apply these things that we were discussing. So the first thing that you want to do is choose your event. Um, that's always, what do you want to look at? Um, is that an HAI? And a lot of times those events will be tied into your surveillance methodology. So um, it kind of goes, what came first, the chicken or the egg? All three of these kind of happen simultaneously. Um, so you can kind of modify the order, but first look at what event are you going to specifically look at when you're conducting surveillance structuring and of what am I going to look at? What resources? in what facility line. And within that, you'll drill it down and you'll assess and you'll define your population. So is this a certain type of patient population, such as you're only looking at adults, neonates, infants, pediatrics, uh, geriatrics? Is there a specific age range you are looking for, such as adults from 40 to 65? Or is it 65 to 85? What parameters are you looking at? And along with assigning or assessing your patient population, you're also looking at what services are provided. So is this in a specific area? Are these all surgical patients, medical patients? Um, are they in a specific unit such as rehabilitation? Are they ambulatory? Are they bed bound? Looking at all these other components, and then that's helping you to identify what risk factors within your patient group that you are having. 
Um, so that will, your risk factors will be based on what specific patient population and then what services that you're specifically looking at. And by knowing all that, then you should be able to determine, are you looking at total surveillance? So every patient um, that's admitted, that stays for 48 hours throughout the facility, or are you looking at a targeted surveillance of patients that are undergoing uh, surgeries, therefore you're looking at surgical site infection, or are you looking at a combination such as there's been an increase in an HAI within a specific unit, so now you're doing drill down to try to identify some infection reducing risk measures that you can implement. So next, you want to determine your time period and you want to make sure that your time period is long enough that you get enough um, events to happen within that, but not too long. So it's kind of the just right model, not too short, not too long, but just right. Um, and you can always start out with a, a, a common one that we look at is 30, 60, 90. Um, especially 90 days in healthcare systems, it goes into quarter, uh, your fiscal quarters, your quarter one, two, three, and four, and that's a great way to gauge that. That's also um, industry standard of gauging your certain uh, metrics, so that's always helpful to use. Um, or it can be monthly if you're looking at a certain processes, improvements of wanting to really identify. So it kind of depends on what you're looking at and your specific population to within your facility. So if you are a smaller facility and maybe you have lower numbers of admits or patients, maybe doing a longer time period so that you're getting a, um, enough people within that event um, or that opportunity for those events to arise as well. The next thing you'll want to do is identify your surveillance criteria or develop your case definition. And this will be a standardized definition that you will use for each event within that reporting period. So for some things, there are standard definitions that you do not have to create that have already set through our regulatory agencies that make a case. Um, and a great example is our NHSN uh, epi definitions of what dictates a healthcare acquired infections for CAUTI, Class C, SSI, and C diff, and GRO infections. Those are standard definitions. Each year, NHSN comes out with a new model of definite, or sorry, a, a, a manual of definitions that we'll use. And within that whole reporting year of 2024, you're using the 2024 definitions of NHSN. Then going in 25, you'll be using 25. So that's great when we have a standard set, but what about for things that are emerging pathogens and how do we handle that as if there is no set standard definition? So when you're having in that case, say as we saw in the COVID-19 pandemic, you want a broad enough but not too broad definition to start with and then tailor it as more information comes available. That's okay. And that is what we should be doing when information is not available. However, when you are changing your case definition, you need to close out your time period and start a new time period so that you, when you go back and you are conducting analysis, you have what we call in epidemiology less um, residual confounding and that you have the same uh, grouped categorical variables because you're using the same definition. So, for example, in 2020, when COVID started coming out, you could have broken it down um, from January to March, uh, March 31st, 2020, of using one definition that you used to define upper, or not upper, but respiratory infections. And as more information came evolved and more information was coming out about uh, COVID. Uh, 19 in symptomology, then you're using that definition from April 1st to say July 1st of that criteria within your patients. And then as more information was coming available, then August 1st, you were using that definition to December 31st um, so that you are using the same definition 
um, throughout that, when you're going back retrospectively of looking at it, you know how to compare and what case definition is using. So just make sure that you're using, even if there is not a standardized definition that you can use from the literature or the guidelines when you're in your facility, that you are then categorizing your data with that specific definition. So next, after we have our definitions, then we're going to determine what method of analysis that we are going to be used. Um, and this can be based on the data that you're collecting. As I mentioned before, a lot of our benchmarks are rates and ratios. They're very easy to interpret. They're a great way to communicate urgency on a certain issues. A lot of your C-suite um, and community um, individuals will understand this type of analysis and so you can really buy in and the importance of when you are then implementing and making recommendations for risk reducing measures that you already have buy in for it um, for those things and then next you are then determining how you are going to collect your data aka where are you going to find your data and how are you going to manage it so there's three main ways that you can do data collection or looking at for certain things on surveillance. You can do retrospective, which is the event has already passed and maybe you're going back and doing a deep dive. Um, a good thing, a pro for retrospective is that the data is already collected. However, a con can be that there be some missing data from that time. Um, so you have no control. You can't go back and interview the patient that came in three months ago with a specific um, rash of asking where they were, what did they have, these certain types of exposures, that's not available. Compared to concurrent and prospective, you can have that all laid out and identified of what specific things um, that you want to be looking at uh, for your data collection process. Um, and then going to um, forward of collecting it. The downside with concurrent and prospective data collection is that it does take a lot of time. Um, results take time, getting imaging, um, so it does take more time and there might be some delay with the turnaround of getting some of your data collected. Then looking at your source of data, so where can you find your data in healthcare settings, a lot of it is your um, patient's chart that you have, um, your EMR report that you can develop um, as well for certain things. Um, you can work with your bioinformatics, your IT to develop within your EMR system reports that they can pull for you um, on certain things such as um, ways to properly identify things more quickly for you. So they're always a great resource to really tap in of sitting down of, hey, can you set a query? Can you do an algorithm to kind of pull some data for you so that you can quickly review it and you don't have to go through individual patients chart and look for specific things. You also have internal dashboards that you have at your facility. Again, tapping into your IT or your bioinformatics group. Um, and then also your auditing practices. That's a great way to collect data and kind of understand what the process is that's occurring within your facility. So next, then we are gonna identify our I, components of data of how we are going to collect it along with um, what I forgot to mention with management of then how are you gonna store this data? So you are collecting all this data where is a central item that you can have this that is that you can readily access it? Is this going to be in a binder? Is it going to be in a PDF? Is it a Word document? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it an internal dashboard? Can you have IT build you an internal dashboard that you can give certain rights and access to um, certain leadership to go in and look? Um, so you always want to make sure that you're collecting it and it's in a one place in a standardized place and then also through your group, whoever is collecting the data, you have educated and trained them uniformly. So data collection based on IP is standardized. So how IP A is collecting data is the same way that IP B is collecting data. So then you don't have missing data within your within your group. 
And then lastly, the next thing is just to go collect your data and making sure that you are getting relevant information. A big thing to always collect is your demographic information, um, this patient's name, address, phone number, in case that you need to follow up with them um, after they've been discharged or that public health needs to follow up with them after being discharged out of the facility or being transferred to another facility. That's really important information. Along with the um, background data that's relevant, to you, um, along with all information needed to make your case definition and specific risk factors that you've identified, um, either from the literature, talking with specific providers, talking with subject matter experts of additional things that can maybe contribute to increased risk of developing the event or having that um, adverse event occur and potentially cause harm. So that's kind of all the ways that we conduct surveillance from how we conduct it, where we conduct it, our standardized way, what resources we can use in healthcare systems, our topics that we conduct surveillance. And then from all that information, then how do we develop a surveillance plan? So the first step is then to write your surveillance plan and that lays out what specific facility, if you're acute, long-term nursing home, outpatient, urgent care, freestanding ER, what services that you are specifically looking at, goals or objectives or your aims of your specific surveillance plan, if that is um, increased hand hygiene compliance, if that's HAI reduction measures, what specific HAI reduction measures, and then laying out all specific criteria that you're going to be using um, for your case definition, how and when you're going to collect your data, along with what policies and procedures that you are going to reference, and that should be all written down in your plane, along with um, your timeline of when you are implementing this plan, and other metrics that you're going to be looking at specifically and what key stakeholders are involved in this plan. So that all goes into your plan development. And then um, after you develop your plan, you're giving it to those involved. It's all agreements. Then you implement your plan. So that's now putting your plan into action. And this goes into monitoring staff, reviewing processes, improvement, um, looking at certain things, um, and kind of see what's going on from that component. The next is then, the last step is evaluating your surveillance plan. So you always wanna be checking in with your surveillance plan, not just at the end, if you're setting a goal for a 90 days plan improvement, but also setting in within different marks, uh, like ch different checkpoints. So at, if you're setting a plan for 90 days, you're evaluating on 30, 60, 90 to make sure that what you actually constructed and implementing is actually operational, that you're actually on the right path to reducing those measures, or what you have suggested, if you cannot implement it, then you are modifying your surveillance plan um, to make it more reasonable and actionable for what you're wanting to achieve. So I know that was kind of a lot of information, and now we're just going to go into a quick scenario of how we're conducting surveillance and then developing a surveillance plan. So this is always a favorite surveillance uh, a scenario of mine that, um, so you are the IP in the facility, and you are reviewing your data analysis, and you're specifically looking at healthcare acquired infections related to C. diff or your HA C. diff infections. And as you're reviewing your data, it is now end of Q1, so that means that it's March of 24, and you're reviewing the last three months of your C. diff data, and you see that there has been a huge increase of C. diff infections within your facility. So you're looking at quarter one, and you notice that there are 12 C. diff infections, and you're thinking, man, I don't remember that being a problem last year, maybe something has changed. So then you go back and you're looking at quarter two or the last three months of last year of 23, and you're seeing, oh, in th three months time, we only had three infections last year related to the NHSN CDF criteria measure. And it was 
within different units and then you're looking at this year's measures man we've had 12 3 to 12 is a huge spike in difference and then as you're drilling down you're noticing it's one specific area that's struggling and that is your ICU you're seeing that every month since December ICU has had at least one or more C. diff infections so at that time, then you're thinking, how, oh, what's going on in ICU? So then you pull up your isolation list of C. diff patients and you see that three patients in ICU currently have C. diff infections. They either have a confirmed C. diff infection or they're being ruled out for a C. diff infection. So then you go up to the ICU and you want to monitor isolation compliance in the ICU. So then you bring out your isolations compliance sheet. You see your three patients in ICU. You have Jane Doe, John Doe, and James Doe, non-related. Um, and you've already determined that there's no epi link, that there it hasn't been one exposure already, or that it's from a family or community event that they all came in at the same time. They're having this. Um, so then you start auditing what's the isolation practice. So you stay and observe isolation compliance on the unit. And you're grading them and you're noticing, is the isolation sign posted? Is it visible? Is there a supply? Is the cart stocked? Are they wearing the right PPE? Can the staff speak to why this patient's on isolation? And is that isolation appropriate? As in, are they on contact isolation um, for sedative or did they accidentally put an order for uh, respiratory or droplet isolation? Next, then you're observing personnel going in and out of the room and you're seeing how compliant they are. You're looking at hand hygiene. Is there isolation noted in their EMR along with the order set and why they're being rolled out? Has education been documented and provided to the patient and their visitors of why they need to gown up, potential risks, and then you're grading them. So within your time that you're auditing the isolation compliance, you're seeing that one out of your three people is 100% compliance, which is good, but it's not great. That's only 33% compliance out of your sample group from this one event. And then you have two other people um, that are rating below. And during that time, then at the end after you've graded, you go and speak to the specific um, healthcare team that's involved in that patient's care of, you know, why are you doing it this way? Are you aware of CDF? A policy procedure? Do you know about hand hygiene? Do you know how to properly don and doff? And you're kind of, you're stopping the line and you're having those discussions at the bedside with the specific staff involved, especially the staff that are non-compliant. And you're kind of gauging, is this a retrainable moment? Is this a failure to be compliant moment? Um, so that you can kind of have an understanding of what's going on. So based on this information, then you go back to your infection prevention uh, department and you just decide that, hey, is this appropriate or is this not? Was the goal to be um, at 72% compliance or is that not our goal? And that should never be your goal in infection prevention. The, go the goal for isolation compliance should always be 100% along with 100% uh, hand hygiene compliance. So you're like, huh, I, this, this isn't great. Um, so then you take a step back and is this a trend of event um, that this is a, a, an issue or is this a one-off event? Did something happen on the unit that there was a difficult patient? Maybe they got a, a, a huge influx of patients. Did something happen overnight? Uh, what's going on with that? So then you speak to your other infection preventionists and you ask them about their rounding experience in the last couple weeks, 30 days of, hey, have you guys noticed anything? Has this been an issue when you've been up on the floor? Have you had to stop the line and done coaching? And if the answer to this is yes, that this is a common issue that you are then seeing, the next step then is to call a meeting with all key stakeholders in this situation. It is the infection prevention department along with the unit specific, which is the ICU, which is having issues with this specific, along with the environmental services department. So you always want to loop in other departments to make sure that you have a collaborative, uh, collaborative approach to um, your measure that you want to be implementing um, so that you have an effective plan. So next, you're calling the 
a meeting and you're having the your I see you manager or director, your environmental service manager or director, and yourself to try to talk about the issue of saying, hey, there's been a spike in uh, HAI, specifically seeded. You show them the data um, from quarter one compared to quarter four, specifically in this area. You can talk about your drill down events and then you talk about your rounding experience of, hey, that's when I rounded on isolation compliance, they've been under compliance. This could be part of the issue. Um, so let's specifically look at our isolation policy, our hand hygiene, our disinfection policy to really kind of get a handle of maybe is our policy outdated? Do we have current best practices? Are we educating on best practices? So this is a round table discussion between all leaders of, hey, what do we know is going on? What have you seen on your end? Um, has there been any issues in training? Is there any issues in staffing? Has there been a product recall? Have we switched products? Those are all conversations that you'll have. And if there's been no big change, um, such a product or staffing, then the option is to then let's develop a plan to try to reduce these measures and try to see if we can get a handle on this issue. So the next thing when we're developing our plan, we first agree, you have agreements and all key stakeholders that there is an issue. And as you're reviewing the policy that, hey, this is a problem, the next thing is to determine, hey, we need to take action. And so the first step is determining what action that you need to take um, and what kind of goal setting do you want to do? And a good one is, for HAIs, it's going X amount of days without HAIs, or with this instance, it's looking at certain um, isolation compliance. Can we go 90 days without uh, being 100% isolation compliant? Um, and then within the plan, you're setting your timeline is are you're wanting to do process improvement um, each month, a quarterly, semi-annually, annually. And for this example, we're gonna try to do um, since we saw a big shift from quarter four to quarter one, then we're going to do um, three months time or one quarter. Um, and then we are dictating and agreeing what is going to be infection prevention responsibilities for this action plan, the units responsibilities and EBS responsibilities within this plan. Um, specifically, so you want to make sure that everyone's rules and responsibility are clearly laid out and there's agreement within those plan development. So then um, you're developing a plan, you're saying who's doing what. Um, for example, that IPC is gonna round every day, every other day, every week, check on isolation complaints. Nursing unit is gonna round every X day. They're gonna do unit huddles. They're gonna look at retraining. EVS might do um, more of a cleaning audit, do a contact trace. Um, checking expirations on materials, um, and that's all putting into your plan. And then once those rules and responsibilities and agreed upon with timeline, um, you wanna make sure that you are also including checkpoints for that evaluation within your plan. So you have your goal at the end of your plan of in 90 days, you wanna be having no CDF HAIs in the ICU, but then you're doing check-ins every 30, 30, 60, and then 90 days with the team leaders to see how things are going and what you are proposing is actually actionable and you can operationalize it. So that's looking at those specific metrics. And then after that has all been set in stone, then you're implementing it. So everyone has what knows what timeline, they're in agreement um, of that. And then you are then at the end of the time, you are evaluating your plan and also evaluating with that in that 30, 60, 90 days. So during that uh, mini evaluation, you're saying, is this actionable? Is this too time consuming? Do we have buying from staff? Um, you're looking at all those components to see what's going well and what's not going well so that you can modify your uh, plan. And then the last thing is to determine an endpoint of your plan is this um, a situation where it's now resolved um, and you don't have to have these meetings every month on this specific issue or does it become part of your annual infection prevention plan and this is now your new standard practice at your facility based on this information.
So that was kind of just a brief overview of surveillance um, and how it is such a critical role to help identify potential emerging pathogens, reduce outbreaks, identify when there's an outbreak, and really keep a handle on MDR rows. Um, surveillance programs are so beneficial to healthcare settings because it really helps us keep our environment safe for patients and staff by identifying and then implementing risk-reducing measures to have more positive or less harmful outcomes. Um, and specifically looking at pro uh, improvement indicators as in reducing harm, which then increases safety, um, helping us prepare for emergency preparedness and public threat issues um, and getting prepared for the next pandemic. Because um, we know at this point, it's not, if there's gonna be something, it's gonna be when there's a new pathogen at our doorstep. So now it's your turn. Um, we're gonna go into our learning module, the next section. Um, we encourage uh, participation from everyone um, so we're asking um, for you to, once we go through the, cert, the short knowledge check, it's just 10 questions, um, feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you to have you talk about the question, uh, provide answers um, before we open it up to full question and answers. So our first question, what is surveillance? What was the definition that we used today? Is it A, an incidence proportion? Is it B, a comprehensive measure that we look at? Is it C, a group of cases? Or D, is it a method of measuring whether a person can be identified having a particular disease? So feel free to put the answer in the chat or uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you. For those that have answered in the chat, yes, the correct answer is B. It's a comprehensive measure that looks at many different things. Question two, what are some purposes of conducting surveillance? Is it A, identifying diseases, B, assessing effectiveness, C, determining baseline, or D, all the above? Great. I'm seeing great responses in the chat. Yes, it is D, all of the above. You guys are doing wonderful. Question three, true or false? Surveillance programs are guided by mandatory federal, state, and facility reporting requirements. True or false? Yes, true. The main reason why we conduct surveillance to be in compliance and increase safety. Question four, what are three main types of surveillance programs? In programs, we need more methodology specifically. Do we look at whole house total? Do we do focus? Is it whole house with targeted um, in combination? Or is it targeted just looking at HAIs and focus surveillance? Yes. We have whole house, targeted, and a combination of both. Question five, what are our surveillance measures? Is it frequency, mean, medium, mode, tendency, percentages? What do we look at in infection prevention? Yes, the correct answer is A. We look at frequency, which is our rates and our ratios, our central tendency, our mean, medium, mode, Dispersion, which is our spread, and then percentiles. Question six, true or false? Total surveillance focuses on a specific patient group, procedure, or pathogen. B, yes, that is targeted specific, so this is false. Question seven, for an infective infection prevention program, we need to what? A, identify the surveillance method. B, identify the surveillance method that we'll use. C, identify the surveillance that we'll use. 
choose to monitor event, determine observation period, or D, assess the population. So what do we do? Yes, that's awesome. Great response from the chat. A is the correct answer. Question eight, what are some disadvantages or some cons of concurrent surveillance? Findings may be delayed, complete medical record, the time involving to locate or incomplete, waiting on results, um, D, missing information obtained at discharge. Yes, it can be either C or A. Um, it can be a lot of delays and then also physically locating or having incomplete uh, medical records or waiting for results. Um, so either A or C, yes, that is correct. Nine, surveillance program and healthcare should be integrated with what? Emergency preparedness and policy, control measures, surveillance and outbreaks, infection prevention, pandemic and history. Infection prevention and control measures, emergency preparedness, and public health activities. Yes, D. We want to make sure that we're integrating all these things into our surveillance activities. And lastly, true or false, a critical step in designing a surveillance program is assessing a surveillance report. True or false? It's actually false. There is no surveillance report. You want to do plan evaluation. If there was a surveillance report, that would be great because that already presets. Um, so this is kind of a tricky question, but the answer is B, false, because there is no specific report. There's a plan that you have, and then you want to make sure that you are assessing, implementing, and then evaluating your plan. So great job, everyone. And then here's just your answers, which you'll also, um, within that week, as I mentioned previously, when you get the email that is attached with the slide deck, you have um, to reference back to. And then we just invite you all to connect with us. Here's a couple QR codes. Our first one is to our IPC monthly series that we are doing. The second QR code is specifically to TEPI resources and know more about what TEPI has to offer and the other TEPI programs. You can email us directly at IPC at tepi.texas.gov and then general inquiries to info at tepi.texas.gov. And then our last announcement before we kind of open up for any questions is our next module will be 204 called Data Handling. It will present um, May 2nd, so in a month on Thursday from our 2 to 3 p.m. And we are going to look at what data to collect data cleaning and data presentation. So this is kind of more just in infection prevention, how we handle data and how we present it, specifically um, data communication and how we are getting buy-in from our different communities and different levels within the healthcare system that we are communicating this data and how to kind of show that um, effectively and efficiently along with how we kind of are presenting our infection prevention data. And then lastly, um, Here's a QR code to our post-survey and the uh, evaluation. We appreciate everyone that would complete it. It is a short survey, it should take you about two to three minutes to complete. And if you complete the survey, you have a chance to enter in your email to win some Tuffy merchandise that we will mail out to you as well. Um, and this information is really greatly appreciated. It helps us develop different modules, present different topics that you all are interested. In. And we wanted to say thank you for spending an hour with us today and your time and attention to our uh, lecture today. And now we'll open it up for any specific questions. I have a question for the group if there's no questions. Did you like the material? 
Yeah, Hannah, I can scroll back so that you can see the answers. Did you like the surveillance topic? Great. I know there's a lot of, in infection prevention, we do a lot of surveillance and then surveillance is very tailored to your infection prevention program, specifically your patients, your facilities, your service lines. Um, so this is kind of just a brief introduction of like how you get started with conducting surveillance. Um, so yes, uh, to the question, do you monitor SSIs in the OR? Yes, we. you can go in and look at setup um, in your ORs, any scope procedures, especially if you have a specific rise in um, all your SSIs or if you're looking at a specific case or a specific department, such if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at your, uh, like colonoscopies or colons or your kits, uh, looking um, specifically within your GI department or your um, gynecology department of then grounding up with them, going in, seeing how they do their setup, how they're doing their um, uh, pre-surgical scrub, um, looking, monitoring the traffic in and out of the room, looking at your engineering controls, looking at your pressure with your room, uh, tracing your sterile devices. Yeah, you can absolutely, if you're definitely seeing a rise in any specific case, that's the best thing to do is go using that methodology of that combination. If you're starting to see the rise in SSIs, is it all SSIs throughout the facility? So you're seeing, you know, um, ENT, you're seeing gynecological issues, you're GI, you're seeing nephro, any type of thing, and then working with those departments, um, specifically if you're going to go in and monitor surgeries, that you're having a roundtable discussion, and when you're putting your surveillance plan in place, that you are talking about how the flow is going to be, making sure that you're gowning up and that you're ready for cut time. Um, and then you're also reviewing antibiotic administration during that time as well. Those are all things that you would have in your written surveillance plan that you're talking about before you start implementing this to really track to see if there is a specific surgeon device or instant or an instrument that has led to increased infection um, or if it's certain things. Uh, that's a great question. How do your surgeons feel about this? Um, it really depends on your culture. The best way to get buy-in, I know, is that saying, hey, we're, we've identified a patient safety issue. There's been an increase in potential harm that we are doing on patients. You have an increased rate of infections on this specific procedure. Uh, we want to really get to know the root cause and so that we can improve our practice so that we're having better patient outcomes. Um, and we're providing better care to our patients. So making sure that you are framing it right, um, it's always uh, better to frame it in the, that, um, the words of this is for our patient improvement, um, and then also having leadership support of this. So definitely having your C-suite, your director, um, your medical director of that certain department, or if it's of surgery, um, your CMO, your doctor in charge of all the doctors, making sure like there's proper buy-in for this, that this is an important thing. And especially with um, SSIs, it can go into your CMS rating. If you're a trauma center, these numbers also impact, impact other um, certifications or your ratings, credentialing, um, or Medicare dollars. So you might have a huge buy-in from that as a financial kind of part too. So making sure that you get all buy-in, um, but definitely having your leadership help navigate those conversations with you. Feel free to email us uh, with any other specific questions um, that you need help with. Uh, thank you all for coming to today's lecture, um, and we look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you.